Thank you for joining me and welcome to Eye on Business. I'm Ben Kritz. Today I will be doing my end of year review for 2019, as one does, and providing some insights about the year ahead. This cycle of reflect and project is a thing that newspaper columnists and talk show hosts do every year at about this time, and since I am both of those things, it's more or less a requirement for me. So let's get right to it. 2019 was, like most years, a year of up and downs for the Philippines, and it depends on your particular perspective or context, whether or not the year was just passed was a good one or a bad one. For those of you who follow my column in the Manila Times, first of all, thank you. And second, you are probably aware that I focus on economic issues, and in that respect, I would characterize 2019 as the calm before the storm. From my perspective, there were three major developments in 2019 that are going to make 2020 a very challenging year for the Philippine economy. The first was the delayed national budget. The second is the explosive growth of the Philippine offshore gaming operations industry, which we refer to as POGOs. And finally, at the, towards the end of the year, the water crisis in and around Metro Manila which built into a major chaos by the end of the year. I'll explain why each of these th three things will matter in 2020, what happened and what we can expect in the year ahead right after this short break. And we're back. 2018 seemed to end on a high note, economically speaking. The first and most important package of the government's tax reform program had been passed. The Duterte administration seemed to be finding its stride in its build, build, build infrastructure program, and the government's fiscal position was outstanding. The economy was growing at an impressive pace, more than 6%. Optimism about 2019 was high as the 2018 year ended, but evaporated almost as soon as the year started. The trouble began right after the New Year's holiday when the country discovered, much to our dismay, that our lawmakers, who thoroughly belied the wisdom implying epithet Solon, which they are often referred to in the media, had left the government without a budget for 2019. The reason for this, as we quickly discovered, was a stupid territorial dispute between the two houses of Congress. That impasse was eventually resolved, but it took four and a half months to do so, during which time government spending was approximately one-tenth of its normal level. The government should have been spending about 11 billion pesos per day. They were spending less than two. In fact, because government moves so slowly even under the best of circumstances, it took almost three more months after the budget was finally enacted in May for government spending to return to a level that was close to normal. That happened around September. All that time, of course, things were not getting done. Back when that budget impasse was still unresolved earlier in the year, I had written in my column for the Manila Times that the Philippines was risking a lost year economically if that dispute was not quickly resolved. Of course it was not, and the last year is exactly what the economy experienced. Of course, government officials would probably dispute that assessment, and objectively, that the economy still managed to expand by over 5%, even while government spending was severely limited, that's still rather impressive. But because government spending has such a multiplier effect, effectively losing it for half a year puts the entire country half a year behind where economic policymakers anticipated it would be as 2020 begins. Fewer investments, fewer jobs created, less business and consumer spending, in part because everybody held up for half a year until the program took effect. 
Oh, that means less tax revenue for further government spending. So the problem sort of feeds on itself. The delay leads to less spending, leads to further delays, which means in 2020, the government will fall further behind its aspirations as the year progresses, which means that despite being publicly optimistic that it can catch up, it won't. Many of the projects and programs that were promised in 2016 will not see the light of day. On the one hand, that makes what progress has been achieved already and what is still to come all that much more remarkable. On the other hand, it adds to a growing list of might have beens and seemingly broken promises that may, perhaps not altogether fairly, may begin to erode public and investor support for the administration. One area in which, in which uh, we are going to see much less progress than what was anticipated is in the infrastructure program, which of course was just reset about the middle of December. Um, they've lowered the bar on what they expect to achieve. You know, that's unfortunate, but it's probably realistic. We'll be right back after these messages. Mga isyong pinag-uusapan, mga palitang laman ng pahayagan, impormasyong dapat niyong malaman, tatalakayin, pupusisiin, at hihimayin ni Mario Garcia kasama ang kanyang mga panauhin sa harap ng bayan. Face Off! One of the most interesting and alarming phenomena we witnessed in 2019 taught us all a new word, POGO. Now, POGO stands for Philippine Offshore Gaming Operation. And even though this business actually began here about four years ago, about 2015, the public perception, which has been well-founded, was that it came out of nowhere all of a sudden this year. Almost overnight, it seemed there was a pogo on every corner, employing thousands of Chinese workers who were taking over entire neighborhoods. And, of course, in short order, the complaints started. Many of the Chinese workers were here illegally. There was an apparent increase in criminal activity and a general erosion of the quality of life in areas where they are concentrated. Filipino residents and small businesses were complaining about being forced out of their longtime homes and business locations by greedy landlords eager for the exorbitant rents Chinese are willing to pay for spaces to set up pogo businesses. Now, the pogo business does have certain benefits. It has been a boon to the local property sector. Office space uptake is at an all-time high, and so are rents. And up until the beginning of 2018, that sector had been facing a bit of a downturn due to an oversupply of office space. That problem no longer exists. And the POGOs do contribute a moderate amount of tax revenue to the government. According to the Department of Finance, that's about 2 billion pesos per month. And of course, they have a vast army of workers and these people shop in our stores and visit our movie houses and contribute to the to economic activity in this country in the form of consumer spending. The public perception is, however, that these benefits pale in comparison to the negative effects of the Philippines suddenly hosting what amounts to an enormous Chinese money laundering enterprise. That's because gambling is officially illegal in China itself, and for a good reason. Gambling operations of any kind, although they are not inherently bad, they're a handy way for people to divert income that could be taxed or to launder ill-gotten gains. Now, not every Chinese gambler is some kind of crook, of course, but enough of them are that beginning about six years ago, the Chinese government began cracking down on the various avenues in which its citizens could legally gamble, i.e. outside their country, in an effort to combat its country's own enormous con corruption problems. The Chinese efforts had a serious impact on the gambling industry in places like Macau, which drove the gambling operators to look for other locations beyond the reach of Chinese authorities, places like Vietnam, Cambodia, and the Philippines. 
The pogo business is one of the very few areas where public sentiment, which has otherwise been very supportive of President Duterte and his administration, runs counter to that of the government. The president has said, and we may assume he is simply passing along what he has been told by his investment promotion officials, that he is reluctant to ban the pogos outright because people's livelihoods will be affected. This is frankly complete nonsense. It is unlikely the livelihood of any Filipino will be negatively affected at all because the pogo industry, no matter how the IPAs and the local property sector tries to spin it, is an entirely Chinese business employing Chinese workers and with the profits flowing not to this country, but back to our big red neighbor in the north. Now, the Chinese government, in fact, has asked the Philippine government to ban gambling, which may be out of line, but it should be taken as a warning by the government. The Chinese are working very hard to figure out exactly how to crack down on pogos in the same way that they crack down, say, on the casino business in Macau. And being pretty smart people, they will eventually figure it out. I believe that crackdown is going to come in 2020, one way or another. And unless the Philippines figures out to, how to exercise some control over that process, either regulating or taxing the POGOs out of existence on its own, it's going to create a great deal of havoc for this country, particularly in the real estate sector. And the reason why is that Real estate developers have been counting on the continuing inflation of demand and prices due to the growth of the pogo industry. Any forecast that you see from real estate developers says this. As a result, that's created a huge property bubble. If the Duterte administration is proactive in eliminating pogos in a controlled fashion, the air might be let out of that bubble slowly in which case the economic damage won't be too bad and will be easy to deal with. But if it waits for the Chinese to do it, that bubble's going to explode. Either way, that's going to be damaging to the economy this year. There's no way around that. Just how much depends on how well our economic policymakers anticipate and respond to it. One of the ideas that's being floated in Congress right now is to add additional taxes to the POGOs. That may delay the damage, but I don't think it will prevent it. And I'll be back after this break. Hi everyone, I am C. Hervasho, and welcome to the new Clark City, where the 30th Southeast Asian Games will be held this November. Dito gaganepin ang tagisa ng mga atleta mula sa iba't ibang bansa ng Southeast Asian region. come to a problem that affects every one of us, especially the people here that live around Metro Manila, present company included. In March of this year, the people of Metro Manila got a nasty surprise in the form of a widespread water shortage. We all remember nightmarish images of people in certain neighborhoods lining up for hours to collect emergency water supplies businesses forced to close or reduce their operations simply because they did not have water. Of course, the culprit was dry weather, but it was aggravated by a lack of foresight and development by the two water concessionaires for the metro area, Mynilad and Manila Water, and the regulator and the supplier of bulk water for the metro area, the Metropolitan Water Works and Sewerage System, or MWSS. 
That water shortage in the spring eventually eased, but it happened again in August and September. And here I can add a little personal note because I happen to live in a part of town where we were affected by shortage of water. Uh, every night for several weeks, there was nothing coming out of our taps. Then back in October, two interesting developments on the legal front came to the public's attention. First, the Supreme Court ruled against the two water concessionaires in a case dating from 2009 in which both of them were held to have violated the Clean Water Act, and that was because they had not provided sewerage systems for most of their customers as the law mandated, even though they have been collecting the money to do so for, as part of their rates for years. Both companies were hit with a heavy lump sum fine as well as daily penalties of about 300,000 pesos each for every day the promised facilities continue to be missing. Not long after that, Manila Water announced that, well this happened in late November, but they announced that they had won a 7.4 billion peso arbitration claim against the government from an arbitration panel in Singapore. And this was due to lost revenues from a rate hike it was denied back in 2013. My nail ad had earlier won a similar claim amounting to 3.7 billion pesos, although that had not attracted as much public attention when it happened several months earlier. The Manila water claim started an inferno of public fury led by President Duterte, who was informed by the Justice Department that the issue by which the two concessionaires claimed compensation from the third party arbitrator, government interference in the setting of their rates, was only one of at least 12 unfavorable provisions in the concessionaire contracts. Now, the president variously threatened to arrest officials of the water company and those in the government at the time who had negotiated the unfair contracts or on, on charges of economic sabotage. He also said that he might have the military take over the water system and told the two concessionaires in colorful and unequivocal terms that they could take the papers that their arbitration awards were written on and stuff them somewhere. To try to put out this inferno of controversy they had caused, the two water companies have since tritely announced that they will not insist on being paid their arbitration claims and that they are willing to renegotiate their contracts. The MWSS, for its part, has played too late the hero and canceled the 25-year extensions of those two contracts that had been granted back in 2009. That would have extended the concessionaire contracts to 2037. They will now end as originally scheduled in 2022. Now, by the time this show reaches the air, President Duterte may have already made a decision as to which way this crisis is going to go. Shortly before the Christmas break, he announced that he would give the public his decision on January 6th. Right now, we're waiting for that with great anticipation. We may know what it is by the time this comes on, TV being how it works. <clears throat> but regardless of what that decision is, the matter's not going to stop there. That crisis over the water supply has opened a Pandora's box of reflection over the issue of privatization of key utilities and services. At one time, privatization was considered a cure-all for government inefficiency. And we all remember the sorry state of the water system before the two concessionaires took it over in 97. Now, it is being comprehensively and critically questioned. And the only possible outcome to that, one way or another, is going to be a greater government control over systems such as water, electricity, and telecommunications. That doesn't have to necessarily be a bad thing. But in the short term, it's going to be very disruptive to the economy. And that's coming at a time when there are other disruptive forces, such as what we've already talked about, the interruption to the government's six-year development plan caused by the budget delay at the beginning of this year, 
and the likely crash of the pogo industry, the water controversy is going to contribute to what very well may be a year of economic tension and less than satisfying results in 2020. I don't want to start the new year on a downbeat note, however. Yes, there are challenges, but if I can speak personally for a little bit, in 15 years that I have been here observing this country and watching this economy, the Philippines and its people have lived up to their own stereotype of being resilient, if not always living up to their full potential. And as the saying goes, forewarned is forewarned. Knowing where these trouble spots are will help our policymakers and all of us be prepared to withstand them and perhaps even find a way to glean positive outcomes from them. Let's hope so. Whatever happens, it will be an interesting year, and I look forward to being able to share it all with you as things develop. Here's hoping every one of you has a personally rewarding and safe 2020. I'm Ben Kritz, and this is Eye on Business.